Why, hello there. Brent here with Bring Your Own Tools. On today's episode, we are completely transforming this sad wall from this to this. If you want to know how to do it, keep watching. Let it start in. For this accent wall, we're going to be doing vertical slats all the way across this wall, as well as the small adjacent wall to the left. But the key aspect with a wall like this is that you want to have your vertical slats spaced evenly all the way across the wall. This is going to be different for each individual project, but on our project, we have approximately 12 to 12 and a half inches of space between each slat. The blue painter's tape that I'm placing on the wall is just going to give me a determination as to how the spacing is going to be laid out, but it's not the most accurate measurement as you can imagine. But before we even get to our vertical sets, we need to install some wall base. I'm using a MDF paint grade product that is six inches tall. I'm using my sliding miter saw to make sure I have the appropriate cuts for the ends, which in a perfect world, or at least a world that has perfect walls, would be 45 degree ends. Before I nail each board in place, I do try and determine exactly where the stud placements are first, because that way I know I can fully secure each wall base properly with inch and a half long brad nails. When joining your 45 degree mitered corners, you want to try and make sure you have them flush up against each other, but if there are any gaps, I'll be showing how to fill those properly so you never see them once it's painted. Once your wall base is in, you can proceed to your verticals, and for these verticals, I'm using 1x2 MDF paint grade slats. Once I have the height determined, I can then transfer that to the slats and cut them accordingly. And the nice thing is about this project is that the majority of them are all the exact same size. In order to guarantee that all of our verticals will stay in place, I do adhere it properly with some construction adhesive on the back side and then install them with the nails. That's because I can't guarantee that all of these slats will be secured via stud. Most of these nails across this wall won't be hitting studs because the spacing is 12 inches and a normal interior stud placement for residential is 16 inches. After I mark my spacing at both the top and bottom, I grab my trim, position it in place, tack it at the very top and the very bottom with a nail, but before I install the rest of the nails, I do double check the levelness. If it needs to be adjusted one way or the other, I can give it a couple love taps on the bottom and then install the rest of the nails. As I work my way across the room, it's basically the same exact process over and over again. Cut the boards to the appropriate length, apply some adhesive, nail them into place, make sure that they're appropriately spaced out accordingly as well as level, and proceed to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. The one caveat on this project that hopefully you don't have to deal with is the fact that we did have to do some drywall because we removed the existing pocket door in lieu of the beautiful barn door that we'll be installing later after this accent wall is completed. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this other than the fact that we did have to mud it, sand it, and mud it again because my mudding skills are not the best of all time. Let's just say that. One thing I suggest having on hand if you're not trying to get dust everywhere is actually take a orbital sander that's connected to a shop vac and sand with 220 grit sandpaper. That gives you a really nice finish as well as reducing the dust that would be created if you were hand sanding and the less dust in this living space the better. As we wait for the second layer of drywall mud to dry up appropriately, I do finish off our wall base because we need this finished off before we can finish up our accent wall. Around bends and corners such as this, just make sure you're cutting these pieces a bit long because you can always cut them a little shorter, but if you cut them too short, you can never make them longer. Once our mud is dry, I can then sand it with that 220 grit sandpaper till it's smooth and apply the appropriate primer. On this project, we're using PrepRite Pro Block by Sherwin Williams, and I apply it with a nice even coverage with a foam roller. After the primer is dry, I apply a wall texture to match the existing orange peel finish, and now I can finally secure my vertical slats that were remaining for the rest of this wall. 
as you can see, I was able to really do a nice job of positioning these vertical slats on the very edges of the doorway. And that's exactly what I wanted to do on this project because I wanted a nice cohesive look over the entire span. There was one small piece that I had to put right in the center of the doorway. And if you're wondering why I didn't just cut this in one fluid piece, well, we ran out of material on the last stick. But it worked and we can move on to our caulk. And for our caulk, we're using this Alex Ultra by DAP. And there's a number of reasons why we're using this specific caulk. Number one is that it's anti-shrink, so you don't have to worry about shrinkage once it's dry, which no one appreciates. Number two, it provides an extremely nice finish once it's painted. And number three, it actually dries in 15 minutes, so you can be ready for paint in mere moments. I do highly suggest applying a caulk to all your seams because this provides an extremely nice professional look and feel in the end, and if you don't, you'll notice some of these seams open up over time because paint doesn't hide everything. Just make sure you're trying to apply a very thin bead because the removal of the caulk will be much easier that way. But for the holes, we're using this plastic wood putty by DAP. This product can be applied with just a fingertip and I actually add a bit of excess on each one because I want to make sure that we don't have any holes that are concave, only convex because the fact that we're going to be sanding these down smooth once the putty is dry. With this putty I also apply it to any of the seams, especially the mitered corners because I want those perfectly smooth once we have them sanded down. I wait approximately 30 minutes for that putty to dry and then take 220 grit sandpaper and go over all the surfaces. It doesn't take much to sand this putty down, but keep in mind that I do also have this sander connected to my shop vac, so it's collecting the vast majority of the dust. Now that we have our sanding taken care of, I can move on to taping because we're going to be spraying our paint on this wall. For nice crisp paint lines, I do always suggest using frog tape. It seems to be the best when trying to get nice crisp paint lines once you remove the tape from the wall. But just remember the taping portion is not the quickest part of this project, but it will save yourself copious amounts of time in the long run because we're spraying versus rolling. Just make sure you do your due diligence when it comes time to applying your Visqueen because you don't want to get any paint on these beautiful hardwood floors. We have everything prepped and now it's time for spraying. And you've seen both of these sprayers in different videos. This one I've used recently on the Kitchen Cabinet Makeover Series. And this one I've used on other accent molds, but I've never used this one on accent molds. So we're gonna try this one out today and see how we like it. This Wagner Control Pro 170 really provides a professional look and feel and extremely easy to use. All you have to do to get started is submerge the large hose in your paint, then prime the smaller hose. Once that's taken care of, turn it to spray and proceed to filtering out all the water that's left in your hose if you used it in the past. Then once it starts spraying paint, you can then fasten the spray tip to your handle and you're ready to start spraying. The application process is extremely easy. I just recommend applying the paint to your vertical slats first and then to any remaining areas that need paint. That way you're not overdoing the paint and you do want to apply thin layers to this wall which will avoid any drips along the way. If you're wondering what spray tip I'm using, I am using the same spray tip that I used on my kitchen cabinets, which was a 312. And I will make sure and leave a link in the description box below on all the tools and materials that you see in this video. I also want to make a special note to the fact that I am using a proper respirator, so make sure you're taking care of your lungs if you're spraying indoors like this. Oh, I am liking this color. But before we do a second coat on this paint, I want to, have to determine where our lights are going to be placed because these are going to be our bedside lights. They're going to look perfect with this color, but I want to make sure all the dust that's created with this is done before our second coat. So let's figure out the position of this, drill a hole for it, and then we'll do a second coat. These are bedside lights, so you do want them low enough so you can reach them in bed, but you also want them high enough so they don't get in the way of your bedside cabinet. Keep both of those things in mind when determining placement. The easiest thing about the layout is that all I have to do is center it between two slats and drill our hole. I use a large hole saw to make a perfect cut the very first time, as well as use my shop vac to try and collect as much of the dust as I can. As you can see, it wasn't sufficing for all of the dust. 
but this is obviously why we drilled the holes first before we applied our second coat, because after I vacuumed up all the dust, I was able to apply the second coat and have a perfect finish in the end. Once I had the second coat on, I did immediately remove our painter's visqueen and all of our tape. There were a couple areas where I had to touch up, but for the most part, it came off extremely smoothly. And as you can see, there was a couple areas where I did have overspray, but don't worry because a abrasive pad will take care of that extremely quickly. The tape left a perfectly crisp line on the floor all the way across, and as I noted earlier, the tape on the ceiling did an amazing job for the most part, but there were a couple areas where I needed to touch up, but it wasn't bad at all. But now it comes for the fun part, the electrical. And I know what you're thinking, I don't feel comfortable with electrical, and I'm not a licensed electrician, I assure you. But this bedroom is right above a large attic, and I do feel comfortable enough to actually install this lighting myself. Again, if you don't feel comfortable doing this, please hire a licensed electrician, but these are the steps that I took to hardwire these two lights. Luckily, the attic access was right next to our master bedroom, so it was extremely easy to find the stud placement for this wall. Once I figured out exactly where the stud placement was, I then determined where I needed to drill my holes. I'm using a long 3 quarter inch ship auger drill bit. Made it extremely easy to drill through all of our framing, and once we had the hole placed, I could then feed a wire down into the hole to where our hole placement is located in the wall. And trust me, this is not a special device. It is literally just a coat hanger that I made straight and attached the end of it to our electrical wire with some tape. Once I found the wire, I then removed the tape as well as the wire from the electrical and then fed our electrical wire through our round electrical retrofit box. I positioned the box accordingly, give it a few love taps with a hammer and then screw it in once I know that we're perfectly level. The brass arm sconces that I picked up from Wayfair of all places came with this set plate. The set plate I actually positioned right in place of the box, then drilled it into place, and then started working with our electrical. We have a three wire system, the black is hot, the white is neutral, and your bare wire is your ground wire. The device that I'm using to strip the wires are actually called wire strippers because we need to get to the bare copper. I cut off a half inch to three quarters of an inch of copper and proceed to our light. And this light is actually supposed to be for a plug-in light, but I personally don't wanna see any dangling hard wire lines in this wall, which is why we're gonna be hardwiring it in place. I'm using some wire connectors to connect the two blacks together, the two whites together, and I'm actually drilling a hole into the back plate and attaching the ground wire to that because this light doesn't have a ground wire to it. We actually have a hardwired light in our attic, which is perfect because I can now feed our two wires to this unit, and that way I can actually pigtail our electrical off of this one light. Now when you're doing this, make sure you turn off the breaker before you start fiddling around with the electrical because no one wants to be shocked. The important thing with this aspect is that we are applying a pigtail, which means that I'm grouping up all the blacks, all the whites, and all the grounds together, but I also cut and created a third line that's only three inches long that actually connects back to the light. That means the electrical coming into the unit is still gonna be feeding all three lights, but turning off one light doesn't turn off all the other lights. Another very important thing to do, especially if you're in an attic, is to make sure you group up all your electrical wires. You wanna make sure that they are out of the way, even if they're in, in the attic, because if someone unexpectedly came up and it tripped on these wires, you could potentially damage the electrical yourself, as well as potentially shock or start a fire, and none of those things are good. So make sure your electrical components are tidied up and out of the way. But now I'm out of the attic and luckily I come back to a beautiful accent wall that's dried and all I have to do is install some electrical plates because guess what? We are done! I absolutely love how this accent wall turned out. It's extremely beautiful, but it's also simplistic. And the fact that these lights are now hardwired in place is gorgeous and truly transformed this entire space. I can't wait to see it with a bed frame, but it hasn't shown up yet. Oh well, it's still one beautiful, sexy beast. Oh yeah.